the work that is going on in Zambia, I can be part of what God is doing back in Africa. So uh, that's the main purpose. And above all, we are so glad, so grateful to the Lord for according us the opportunity to serve alongside with, with the Lord in different capacities. So we just uh, we just invite you to uh, to come and worship with us at Faith Community this evening. If you have your time, then come worship the Lord with us. Make uh, a good time to have a, a different worship experience. Show you how we worship the Lord in Africa. In Africa, we love dancing a lot. But I've just come to notice that in the States, people don't dance a lot. <laughs> but that's, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, in Africa, we dance a lot. So, uh, so we just just encourage you to come and uh, worship the Lord with us. So, just I'm just going to sing and I can play a song just a little bit, and then you're going to hear a lot of it about this evening if you you have the time to come. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and the love. No one goes to the Father but by me. I'm the way, I'm the truth and the life. No one goes to the Father but by me. I'm the way, I'm the truth and the life. No one, no one goes to the Father. But I be I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the light. No one goes to the Father, but by me. I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the light. No one, no one goes to the Father. But I be, I'm the way, I'm the truth and the light. No one goes to the Father, but by me. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it's better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness, the righteous brother for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He has put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. May God continue to speak to you from this word. the height of World War II, Anoda, Hiro Anoda, was a second lieutenant in the Japanese Imperial Army. And as a, uh, I don't say an information officer, an intelligence officer, he was given a special assignment, and his commanding officer sent him to a remote island in the Philippines called Lubang. And there in Lubang, he was to follow his commander's orders until his commander returned. His commander ordered him in this way. He said, you are absolutely forbidden to die by your own hand. It may take three years. It may take five years. But whatever happens, we'll come back to you. Until then, so long as you have one soldier, you're to continue to lead him. 
you may have to live on coconuts. If that's the case, live on coconuts. Under no circumstances are you, you to give up your life voluntarily. Onoda kept his, his promise, his duty to his commanding officer and waited until his commanding officer returned. Others in his <coughs> platoon surrendered to uh, other forces or deserted, but Onoda kept his promise for 30 years after the war was ended. 30 years. He had to deal with the attacks of the enemy. He had to deal with keeping concealed, but he said that his greatest, his greatest obstacle was nature itself and lazy fellow soldiers. The greatest obstacle for them was keeping their bellies full. And it was so bad that Minota later wrote in his notes that if the enemy had attacked during a mealtime, they would have wiped us out completely on the spot. He dealt, a lot, dealt with a lot of hardships in order to carry out his duties for 30 years. Never getting caught, always evading the enemy, or even when there was no longer an enemy, still being true to his orders until his commanding officer would return. He was not going to surrender, and he would put up with any hardship. Imagine the hardships that he put up, and yet he was loyal. I wonder how many Christians are willing to put up with hardship in order to follow our commander, Jesus Christ. I fear that most Christians are more caught up with our comforts and our own pleasures than to be able to will, be willing to, to put up with any hardship. We, we will follow Christ so long as it feels good and it doesn't interrupt our plans too much. How much are we willing to follow Christ? If we're only willing to follow Christ when it feels good, then we're not following Christ. Jesus told us that there is a cost for following Him. There is a cost. And He promises eternal life, but that eternal life will come with struggles, it will come with trials, it will come with rejections, it will come with hardships. That is also His promise. But his reward will be greater than anything that we've suffered. But Peter, when he writes, knows that Christians who understand their mission and understand the hardship that they are going to have to put up with in order to fulfill their mission, in order to be loyal to our commander, Jesus. The more we know, the better equipped we are to do that better equipped we are to, to do good and to follow Him in the jungle that we face, in the obstacles that we face in, in, and have to overcome in order to follow Christ. Peter writes to encourage us so that we might not be discouraged by hardships. So I think we need to talk about this, that this morning as we continue our study in the life and letters of Peter. But before we do that, let's bow our heads and our hearts for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we come hungry. We come, Lord, laying ourselves before you and, and asking you to come and visit us through your word. We, we know that your word is not just print on a page. It's not just stories in a book. It's not just a list of rules. But your word is living and active. And so we pray that you would send your active presence to us to speak to our hearts, to change us and mold us and shape us according to to your will and yours alone. We pray for the one who teaches that you hide him behind the cross for his sins are many and we haven't come to hear his wisdom which would be limited at best. We've come to see Jesus and him only and it is in his precious and powerful name that we pray. Amen. Most of us are pretty aware of the fact that if we do wrong, there's consequences to pay when we do wrong. But we have a harder time when we do right, when we're trying our best, when we're, when we're trying to do good, and we have to suffer for wrong. In fact, most people, when they face obstacles and they're really trying their best, their, their response is, that's it, I quit, I'm out of here, I don't need this stuff, I'm going on to other things. 
Peter tells us that in our Christian walk, that that's not an option. And that we need to be expecting hardship. He asks the question, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Well, if you've been alive very long, you know that there's a whole lot of people who are going to harm you if you're trying to do good. A whole lot of people. Starts when you're very young. Who do the mean kids pick on? They don't pick on the other mean kids because they're mean. And mean kids, when you pick on them, they're going to they're gonna come right back at you. They're going to do mean things to you. And so the mean kids pick on the good kids. Because the good kids don't, don't get hateful. They don't do nasty things back. You see, the mean kids are really cowards. And, and, and they don't want anybody to, to snap back at them. So they look for the good ones. They, they, they're a target for them. I know. I was a good kid. I didn't really understand it back then. I understand it a whole lot better now as I look back at it. But, but it's hard to see when you're in the midst of that. When I was in junior high, a kid named Walter picked on me for months on the bus because he was riding our bus. And every day he'd go by and smack me or he'd hit me or he'd push me, he'd insult me, he'd swear at me. And I put up with it for months. You know, I knew you're supposed to love your enemy, you're supposed to be good to those who hurt you, and so I put up with it. You know, what, what a good kid does. And then one day on the bus, Walter came by and he spit on me. And that was it. Something snapped inside me. And I got up out of my seat and I started punching. Now, I didn't want to hurt him because I was a good kid. So I punched him in the chest, but I punched him hard, I punched him often, and he didn't get a shot in, and he got the point. The bus driver threw him off the bus, told me he was not allowed to ride the bus anymore for the rest of the year. And I was shocked that the bus driver didn't throw me off, too, because I was the one who got up and started wailing on this kid. But I guess the bus driver had seen for months and months what had been happening, and he knew a lot more than I thought he did. Turns out, Walter was a coward. He never bugged me again. Turns out, at the same time, I wasn't as good as he thought I was. And I wasn't as good as I thought I was either. There was only so much that I could put up with. But you know, it, as I look back at that, I didn't do Walter any good. I got him off my case, but I didn't do him any good. I didn't overcome evil with good. The last time I remember seeing Walter was in high school when he was running through the school, and then the police were running after him, and then I found out that he got arrested for drugs. I didn't do Walter any good. I didn't overcome evil with good, and that's, that's what we're called to. You see, I thought we were just supposed to put up with it. Come here. We're called to overcome. You know... You want to be good. You, you want to be kind to other people. But whether you're a kid or whether you're an adult, because it doesn't change when you're an adult. Adults can be just as, as sophomorish as kids can be, and they can be just as mean and just as hateful and sometimes more creative at it than kids are. But when you want to be good, you become an easy target for those who are mean or hateful. And it may be a co-worker who, who wants to make sure that you look bad so that you'll get passed over and they'll get the promotion. It may be just somebody who's angry at life and wants somebody easy to take it out on, but you become a target. Who's going to harm you if you're willing to do good? Well, you know, there's a lot of people. People resent good people. I don't know if they still use the term goody-goody anymore, but when I was a kid, being a goody-goody was not a good thing. All right? It wasn't meant as a compliment. It, it was meant as a, as a way of distancing you, a way of rejecting you. Oh, they're a goody-goody. They're no fun. Oh, they're a, a goody-goody. Let's see if we can get a rise out of them. It made you a target. Who's going to harm you if you're willing to do good? Lots of people expect it. Not everybody is good. But you're not called to be like everybody. You're called to be different from everybody. And you're called not just to be good, but to be holy. And holy in itself means that you are set apart. 
You are to be holy because he who called you is holy. And so you're not to fit in. And when you don't fit in and when you try to be good, you are going to be a target for the world. We're told to expect that. We're going to rub people the wrong way. Someone once told Billy Sunday, the evangelist, you rub caps the wrong way. Billy Sunday shot back, I don't rub them the wrong way. Turn the cat around. <laughs> Who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what's right, you're blessed. If you should suffer for doing what's right, if you're doing what's good and you suffer for it, you're blessed. That's a tough lesson for the kid who's getting picked on. Oh, yeah, you're being blessed right now. Do you feel blessed? Probably not. But we are told that we're being blessed. It's not easy to still continue to be good and try to be holy and try to be kind when someone is being mean and nasty back to you, whether you're an adult or whether you're, you're a kid. But you know, for a kid, we can see that for a kid who's trying to be good, when they face adversity, there is some good that comes because they're forming their character. And anybody can be nice when other people are being nice to them. Anybody can be good when everybody around them is trying to be good. But when someone's being hateful to you, and you can still be good, when someone's trying to prod you and, and trying to get you to do wrong, and you can still be good, there's something that sets in your character, in your nature, that develops. And so we can see that in a kid, a kid who can overcome and develop that kind of good character. There's a blessing in that. And the same is true for adults because we're all still developing our character and we become what we do. Even if you should suffer for what's right, you are blessed. See, we think we're going to get blessed by those other people, but it's not going to happen. You know, mean is mean, nasty is nasty, and they're probably going to continue being nasty unless the Lord does something in their hearts and changes them. The blessing we receive is not from people, but it's a blessing from the Lord. We know that the Lord is, is doing something in us. We know that the Lord has promised us good so that we will be blessed by Him, first of all, by becoming like Him. Because Jesus was good to those who were evil to him. Jesus, in love, came and faced the cross for the very people who were calling out to for his death and who were attacking him viciously. They were the very people he came to save. They were the very people he poured his love out. If we're going to put, we're going to become like our Heavenly Father. We become like the one who would give his life for those who who hated, who rejected. You know, at one time we were all the mean kids. We were all the nasty ones to God. We were all at one point rejecting God. We were all at one point saying, God, get out of my life. I want to do my own thing. But God still loved us, and he loved us all the way into his kingdom. <coughs> Verse 18 of our passage this morning, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. That's me right there. That's you right there, the unrighteous. He's the righteous one. We're the unrighteous one. It is by His grace that we've been saved to bring you to God. The righteous saves the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. If we have the strength to be good, in the, in the face of evil, we become like him, and we're told that we will receive a blessing as an inheritance, a, a, a blessing from him. Verse 9 of the same chapter says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. When you bless those who are evil to you, you receive a blessing from the Lord that is equal to them. And that is your inheritance, this blessing in the Lord. That inheritance that we talked about last week that can never perish, spoil, or fade is kept in heaven for you. 
And so we bless those who curse us. We are good to those who are evil to us. Now, is that easy? No. That's, that's tough. That's why in verse 14 he follows it up right away in the second part saying, do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Do you ever notice when God says, do not be afraid, that there's a pretty darn good reason to be afraid. Right? Hagar is sent out into the wilderness with her son with no provisions and just expects to die. God shows up and he says, do not be afraid. Moses and the Israelites face an army of the king of Bashan, an armed you know, group of trained soldiers, and, and they've got to face them in battle, and God says, do not be afraid. Angels show up with flaming swords, and God says, do not be afraid. When the angels show up in the middle of the night and light up the sky with the glory of God, and it's an awesome sight, and it's really... Do not be afraid. When God says don't be afraid, there's probably a pretty good reason that you would have been afraid. Peter says, in the face of something that, that may be pretty fearsome, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Remember the one who is with you. There's a scene in the movie Shrek. Anybody seen the movie Shrek? In the movie Shrek, they're walking through the forest, and Donkey is afraid. And Shrek says to him, I'm more frightening than anything we're going to encounter in this forest. Donkey had to remember, he's with Shrek. Shrek's an ogre. <laughs> Nothing's more fearsome than an ogre. So what does he have to be afraid about? As you go through life, you've got to remember the one who is with you, who has promised never to leave you, never to forsake you, who has said, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. The one who is with us is greater than the one who is in the world. He will never leave us. And because we can keep our eye on him, we need not be afraid. Hallelujah. This world gives us lots of things we can be afraid of, but he's greater than this world. I, I think about the, the list in 2 Corinthians 11 that Paul gives of all the ways that he has suffered in following Christ. Look at the list. It, it's just standing all the stuff that Paul went through. I worked much harder, Paul says. Been in prison more frequently. Been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. One time I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent the night and the day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers. I've been in danger from bandits. I've been in danger from my fellow Jews. I've been in danger from Gentiles. In danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Does that sound like a party you want to go to? Does that sound like the job that you want to put in your application for? It's pretty tough. Paul faced an awful lot. It wasn't easy for him to do what Christ was calling him to do. But Paul did astounding things, didn't he? And it won't be easy for you either. But I want you to think about this. Why does Paul write this list? Does he write this list as a warning to say, hey, this is the stuff I encountered. You don't want to go there. No. He doesn't write to dissuade us. He writes to encourage us. No matter what happens to you, God is with you. No matter what happens to you, we can do this. Whatever God calls us to, he empowers us for. You can do it. Paul wants to make sure. I'm so excited. I just keep flipping things all over the place. He wants to make sure that we know and we're trusting in the one who has sent us that there is nothing we need to fear. We do not need to be afraid because of him who is with us. We can 
do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Now, oftentimes, as Christians, we do everything we can to avoid hardship. Now, I don't think we do it consciously, but today I want to bring it out into your conscience. What do people always say when, when you say, I need patience? Don't pray for patience, man. Don't pray for patience. Why? Because when God teaches patience, He does it by giving you the kind of trials that you're going to have to endure patiently. He teaches patience by testing patience. And so Christians are commonly saying, don't pray for patience, man. Don't do it. You don't want what God's going to lay on you. I want to tell you this morning, pay for, pray for patience. Pray for suffering. Pray for whatever it takes that God might use you for His glory. Now I've got to tell you honestly, because as I've looked at this passage, I had to ask myself, have I really been willing to pray in this way? Have I been willing to embrace suffering or hardship or even inconvenience for the sake of the gospel? And God is convicting me that I need to be praying that no matter what it takes, Lord, no matter what I may go through, no matter what I may lose, whatever it takes, I'm yours. Whatever it takes, do it and use me for your glory. I think that's Paul's challenge to us today. Can we pray whatever it takes? I think that's what Jesus says to us when he says that if you're going to follow him, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. That is a total commitment. Whatever it takes, Lord, I will follow you. I will embrace my cross. I will embrace my suffering. Whatever it may be, whatever you may send my way, if it's through suffering that you can use me for your glory, then I embrace it willingly. How can you do that? That's a big step of faith. It comes when we trust in Him. When we believe in confident faith that the presence and the strength and the grace of Christ is sufficient for us. That we know that we can do all things through Him who gives us strength. It comes when we know His promises, when we, when we memorize His promises, when we, when we cling to His promises, so, so that we know, Joshua 1, 9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. These are the kinds of scriptures we ought to be memorizing. We ought to be reviewing that, that empower us to, to live for Him. The psalmist says, the Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? What can mere mortals do to me? There is a time when fear is the correct response, but it is not fear of people. It is not fear of circumstances. Jesus says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Moses writes in Deuteronomy, fear the Lord your God and serve Him only. Reserve fear for where fear should be. So Peter declares in verse 14b, do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Are you afraid? Does your fear prevent you from doing the things that call, God calls you to do? Think about what's the worst that can happen to you. Or you may face rejection. You may, may face trials from other, other people. But Jesus promised you those. He said, you don't belong to the world. But I've chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, and did they persecute him? To death. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. The worst that can happen is that we will suffer the kind of persecution that Jesus promised us in the first place. But the greater the persecution, the greater the reward. So what have we lost? 
or we may be killed for our faith because many have been killed for their faith but Fox's book of martyrs this people person after person who suffered and died for their faith and stood up for Christ but the first 19 centuries of the church did not equal the 20th century there were more martyrs in the 20th century than in the previous 19 combined and the 21st century isn't getting any better could we be killed for our faith yes but what happens if we're killed for our faith? We go to be with Him for eternity. We have a life that cannot be lost because our eternal life is found in Him. In fact, Paul, after all his struggles, his greatest struggle was of wanting to be with the Lord, of wanting to just not any longer have to put up with all the struggles, but to be with the Lord. In Philippians chapter 1, he says, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body, he says. And so for the sake of the church, for the sake of his witness, for the sake of those who he would yet call to Christ, he determines that he's going to stay the course until it's his time. But at the same time, he knows the desire to depart and be with Christ. The worst that could happen is the best that could happen. Verse 17, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Here's the important thing. This is what I think is really important here for us in application. I don't believe that the Church of Jesus Christ in America is going to have a vibrant witness until the people of Christ are willing to say, Lord, whatever it takes, Amen. whatever it takes, use me for your glory. Lord, if it's suffering, then I embrace that suffering. Lord, if, if it's loss, then I embrace that loss. Because whatever were gains for me, as Paul said, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider all things a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish. Anything I might have gained in this world is garbage compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Until the church is ready to embrace whatever it takes to serve God, we're not going to be effective in, in our world. Let me ask you this morning. Are you willing to tell God, Lord, whatever it takes, use me for your glory. Use me. Are you willing to pray with Paul who says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Are we willing to even embrace suffering for following Christ? Are we willing to take up our cross and follow him? Are we willing to do whatever it takes? You think of any of, of the great figures of the church, they're all people who have had to embrace suffering. John Calvin was a great leader in the Reformation, but you know, John Calvin was thrown out of Geneva the first time around. They, they didn't want anything to do with him. I think of Jonathan Edwards, who sparked the Great Awakenings in America by his great preaching. And a few years later, as the Great Awakening died down, his church threw him out as pastor. They didn't want him anymore. This suffering that, that comes with following Christ. Martin Luther King Jr. was a, a great voice for, for equal rights. He was beaten, attacked with fire hoses. He spent time in jail and ultimately was, was assassinated. Do we think any less of him for these things or do we think that he's greater for these things? Who's going to harm you if you're willing to do good? Well, a whole lot of people. But even if you should suffer for what's right, Peter says, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Paul says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. 
Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Haru Anoda, given, given orders by his commander to hold out no matter what, didn't come out of the jungle of Lubang until 1974. People had sent in messages and told him the war was over. He thought it was a trick by the enemy. He refused to surrender. His commander had not returned like he promised. A Japanese adventure went and brought him out of the jungle, but he refused to lay down his weapons because his commander had not returned yet. The Japanese military was so impressed with his loyalty that they found his commander, brought him out of retirement, sent him to Lubang, and brought him to Anoda. And when Anoda met him face to face, he saluted his commanding officer, he laid down his backpack, he unloaded his rifle, and he laid it on the ground. His war was over. His commander had returned. Someday our commander will return. May he find that we have been faithful Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the trials, may we be as faithful to our commander as Anoda was to his. Let's pray. Lord, it's tough to pray whatever it takes. But I pray that as you teach us to follow us, for to follow you, that that you would Empower us by your spirit to embrace whatever it is that comes from your hand. For we know that it is all good, that you are working all things for the good of those who love you and have been called according to your purpose. Help us to trust you, even when those things seem hard, even when those things seem difficult, even when we struggle, even when there are trials, even when there is suffering. Help us to trust you all the way through. Lord, use us for your glory whatever it takes. In Jesus' name.